Well, it is such a blessing, a pleasure, and a privilege uh, to be here with you today. I'm telling you, this is where I want to be in the country right now. We're launching into our first ever conference at our church. We've never done a conference. I know you all have these amazing, don't take them for granted, men's conferences. Who's coming to Stronger this year? You got your Design for Life conference Pastor Debbie's doing soon in October, ladies. Um, I always told God, you know, I wasn't just going to do a conference because every pastor does a conference, every church does a conference. And for 15 years, we've kind of stayed out of it until this past year, God made it unmistakably clear that we were supposed to put ourselves out there for God to use and specifically to do a youth conference. And it all started when I asked a question that God put in my heart. And the question was, who can I reach who can be used to reach my grandchildren? Who can be someone I can touch today that God could use to reach your great-grandchildren. And I think we always have to be asking that question about the next generation. So we're putting it out there. Please do pray for us this week. Uh, we rented a giant rodeo arena, and we've been inviting our youth and youth from around the country to come join us. And we've got our friends, the Tebos coming, and Carrie and Cody, and Phil Wickham, and Crowder, and Chris Kilala. And we're believing for salvation and revival. We're believing for a move of God's Holy Spirit. And we're committing to go all in on this youth-led movement, and we're going to be doing it every year. And what's different about it, maybe from other camps, uh, I know you guys do it, or you guys have got it in your culture, I'm talking about other churches, is, is we're, we're encouraging students to actually stay in actual tents. And we got 30 acres for them to tank camp, because there's something about being under the stars. Something about having bad cell reception in Jesus' name, amen? <laughs> something about being dirty and being out in the elements and maybe getting rained on and then joining untold thousands in the heavens and those on earth worshiping and being lost in his presence. So please do pray for us. And I'll tell you, I think God sent me here to get me full of faith going into this conference week because what God is doing here at James River is unbelievable. What you guys are a part of, what your pastor and his family are leading you into. And the times that we've been here have just been so meaningful to me personally. And I'm really excited about what God's going to do today as we open up his word together. Amen. So, Father, we love you and we are grateful for your kindness. Which is evident as we experience your presence together in these moments. And so now as we turn to your word we ask for that spirit of worship evident and giving evident and praying evident and praising to continue like that incense rising up to heaven for you to, to smell and to see and to be delighted to respond to. We ask your blessing for salvation, for continued healing, for you to move however you want to. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we said amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Psalm 128. We're going to together unpack some of the content that I've been in this season carrying that we've released in my new book, The Last Supper on the Moon. And I, just, I don't know about you, it just it blows me away to know that the first thing ever eaten on the moon was the communion meal. I don't know if you knew that, uh, but Buzz Aldrin brought with him bread and wine. And the first thing mankind in the moon's existence has ever eaten on its surface was the Lord's Supper. That's awesome. That's, and I began to think, and I began, when I found that out, to just ask the question, what, what connection is there as we look to the scripture between the moon and the cross, between this meal that speaks of Jesus' death and burial, and of course, resurrection, and the moon that we see in the night sky? And then it occurred to me that the Jews kept a lunar calendar, not a uh, calendar like we do that's oriented around the sun. And so that means that Passover cannot occur in connect without their connection to the full moon. That's why you'll notice Easter moves around. It's slippery, isn't it? When's Easter this year? You have to ask that because it's not Gregorian. It's not about the sun. It's based on the lunar cycle as the Jews did live their life with the back, their back turned to the sun. You, how, you realize how countercultural that is? 
The whole pagan world, the whole world going back time immemorial, basically worshiped the sun. God had his people turn their back on the sun because they had a brighter sun. His name is Jesus. And we don't, we don't worship the rising sun. We're not all about just getting that tan. We're not just all, you had to enter the tabernacle. You had to turn your back on the rising sun to enter in. It was always on the east side. The tabernacle was oriented. So to come into God's presence, you were turning your back on an earthly sun to look at a brighter sun, the son of God. So they were a lunar people and the lunar movements. So that means when Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, he did so bathed in the light of a nearly full moon. It's a beautiful thought, the connection. I, I say in the book, the moon and the cross cannot be separated. And so as I'm continuing to carry that message, I felt for our time together today, God would have us reflect on that, his plan for our lives, his love for our lives, and specifically when it comes to your marriage. The title of my message is Save the Home, Save the World. Save the Home, Save the World. We'll talk a little bit about space exploration in our time together. We'll talk a little bit about your marriage. We could subtitle this message, Sex That's Out of This World. All right, so that's where, where we're going to be going. Now everyone's awake. <laughs> Psalm 128 is one of the Psalms of Ascent, the so-called pilgrim songs that the Jewish people in the Old and continuing into the New Testament would quote or sing to each other as they traveled to Jerusalem for the three pilgrim feasts. There were three occasions you had to travel to Jerusalem. We know Jesus and his disciples were constantly coming and going from Galilee, from Capernaum, from, uh, from, from Samaria, and they would, they would be going to Jerusalem for these feasts. And God was so good to give them the songs to sing. It's basically like Sweet Home, Al Sweet Home Alabama in the Bible, right? They had so certain songs that always were on the road trip playlists, and Leonard Skinner always makes the cut. I don't know about you, right? And so they would sing these songs. And one of them was Psalm 128. And I recently came under the conviction that I wasn't giving enough of my attention to the memorization of Scripture. Do you know how important it is to hide God's Word in your heart? I know you got a version app. Thanks, Pastor Craig Rochelle. I know you have a Google that you can find the verse that you need when you need it. But guess what? The Bible didn't say hide God's Word in your app. It said hide it in your heart. Jesus on the cross, Jonah in the whale, both quoted the Psalms. The Psalms, the most quoted book in the New Testament from the Old. So over and over again, there's this God's word bubbling out. And so I came under the conviction of I need to work more on this and lead my home more in this way. And so we challenged ourselves and our church community to memorize Psalm 128. And it has been so life-giving to me. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your home, your children like olive plants all around the table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. May you see the good of Jerusalem all your days. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. If you receive that blessing, say amen. 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 Come on. How, how different is God's word than the words of man? And in it, we see this picture, not only of what God wants to do inside your marriage, your family, your home, but the way in which that truly is the mechanism by which we can change the world. Save the home, save the world. I find it interesting that a psalm that really begins at a granular level, speaking about a single person fearing God, ends with an entire nation being rocked by peace. Blessed is the man at the beginning who fears God, and by the end, all of Israel's getting peace. Do you, like me, ever feel overwhelmed when yet again another school shooting, yet again another thing, yet again another example of brokenness, yet again another deranged person does some terrible thing and feel like, what, what can I do? And of course... Everyone starts blaming everyone, and everyone starts saying, well, we need to legislate this, and we need to take this away, and we, we need to, we need, well, surely if there's, if there's no guns, this would never happen, and yet I ask the question, how does a former prime minister get killed with, in a nation that doesn't have guns when someone makes one in the garage? Or a nation like Great Britain where there doesn't have access to it, so someone gets in a car and mows through a crowd of people. 
And so maybe the answer isn't, well, we need to stop this, we need to stop this, but you need to take care of your own house. And to ask the question, perhaps it's not about what we can take away or stop, but maybe it's not about guns, maybe it's about sons. Maybe it's the problem is the fatherless home. Maybe the problem is marriage vows that aren't being kept. And maybe it actually starts. Maybe, maybe when I watch the news and I'm overwhelmed by what's going on out there, maybe the best thing I can do to see peace upon Israel and change happen in the world is to tend to my own soul. Or to put it another way, the greatest thing you can do for the world is to have a strong home. The greatest thing you can do for your home is to have a strong marriage. And the greatest thing, the single greatest thing you can do for your marriage is to have a strong soul. So where does a strong soul come from? Well, the text tells us, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. So counterintuitive, I'll grant you that. But the real change we can do for the world starts by fearing God, bowing our knee and fearing God. You're like, Levi, that's not going to help the world, is it? You know, the argument against the Apollo program, the quest to put a man on the moon and bring him home safely, which President John F. Kennedy laid down before the nation in a message at Rice University and uh, in a joint session of Congress. We choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We'll bring him home safely and we'll do so and the other things by the end of the decade. A lot of people said that's a waste of money. It was expensive. A lot of people said, there's problems on earth. We, we should be spending that money here, having no idea that when we shoot for the stars, it actually does improve life here on earth. Here's a list on the screen of some of the reasons that I think you should be thankful. We wasted all that money going to the moon. Lightweight foldable walkers, CAT and MRI scans, dialysis machines, the implantable heart defibrillator, Memory foam mattresses. Is anybody going to bear witness to the goodness of God at work in the world through memory foam mattresses? That was developed because on re-entry, they needed to absorb some of the impact landing in the ocean of the astronaut in their seat. They invented it because they were going to the heavens, but it made life better here on this earth. Carbon monoxide detectors and the ground was laid for GPS, satellite TV, microchips, and the dust buster. Because crumbs float in space. They had to suck them up somehow. You see, it turns out, though it's counterintuitive, none of these things would exist on earth had we not lifted our eyes to the heavens. The point is, God wants you to live a life for his glory and his renown and his fame. The fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. The secret of the Lord belongs to those who fear him. Turns out, just focusing on how do we change the earth? How do we change the earth? How can I change my community? How can I change this over here? Doesn't do so good. But you lift your eyes up. You fear God. Now there's blessing in your soul because you're walking in his ways. You now serve your wife. Your home becomes fruitful. Your children like olive plants. Now God can bless you out of Zion. Now you can begin to see Jerusalem change. Now you can see peace be upon Israel. Save the home. Save the world. So instead of worrying about what's out there, I need to tend to my own. So how is your marriage doing? I know if I follow you on Facebook, I got, you got opinions about how things should be. But are you tending to your vine? How interesting is the collaboration between NASA and Napa? Not only because the fruit of the vine was brought to the moon, but because NASA companies literally do work for Napa. Napa Valley wineries, Napa Valley vineyards. Why? Because vines need to be cultivated. First C word I need you to jot down. How's your vine doing? How's your home doing? What's the heart of the house? A fruitful vine. The wife, the marriage, that union. That's the foundation that this, the civilization is, is built on. This culture is, look, no nation can long withstand the breakdown of the family. It is the fatherless home that is destroying so many. And so we ask the question, well, how's my vine doing? How's my, 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 my actual taking care of my, my own marriage doing? NASA companies get hired to work for Napa so they can study the ground and ask the question, is this vine getting enough water? Is this vine getting enough nutrients? Where should we best position it? How does this part of the vine react to this temperature in the soil? And they're studying it. They're cultivating it. A vine cannot produce fruit 
unless it's cultivated. So your marriage can't just be on autopilot from the moment you, you said, I do. You have to keep saying, I do. Keep showing up. Keep continuing to show. How, how, how does that begin? Again, it begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, Levi, that's an Old Testament thing, the fear of God. We're New Testament saints. Oh, really? Ephesians chapter 5, the primary New Testament passage on how a marriage should work. How does it begin? Well, I'll tell you how it begins. Wives, submit to your husbands. Hold on. Easy there, pal. It doesn't begin with wives, submit to your husbands. In fact, you will notice in the original Greek, that word submit is not even in that verse. It actually reads wives to your own husbands because the word submission is actually being pulled from a previous verse, which is to one another you submit in the fear of God. To one another you submit. So what is a godly marriage? It is mutual submission to people bending their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ in fear of him. They submit to one another. Wives, yours looks like this to your own husbands. Husbands, your submission looks like this. Love your wives. Are there unique, unique leadership responsibilities for each in a marriage? Absolutely. But submission is for the man as well as it is for the woman. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what that looks like for the vine to be healthy. Are you cultivating your vine by cultivating your soul and growing in your own relationship with Jesus? If you need any inspiration for the whole fear of God category, just Google images taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. On Christmas Day of this past year, 2021, they launched a space telescope. You might have heard about it. I love that it launched on Christmas, by the way. This is the new and improved Hubble. This thing actually makes Hubble look like it was made by Fisher Price. Unbelievable. It's sitting currently one million miles away, taking pictures like this. Some of you saw this image. This was the first taken. You're like, what's the deal? A bunch of stars. Like, I see that every night. No, you don't. As has been reported, this is a section of the sky that's as small as if a human held one grain of sand as far as an arm can reach it away. And Webb took a picture of the spot of the sky as small as a piece of sand, and turns out there's a bunch in that tiny little space. The, the foreground blown out stars, paid no attention to those. Those are normal stars. But beyond it are thousands of galaxies each numbering between a million or a hundred billion stars like our own Milky Way galaxy. And all that is in a piece of the sky as small as a piece of sand. And God made that. And God loves you. And God's got plans for you more than the sand of the seashore. That's why we fear him. He's that vast. He's that powerful. And yet he stretched his arms out on the cross and died for you. And if you have that revelation of his power, but also his goodness, he's a God of both love and thunder. It will make you want to bow your knee to him and bow your knee to him with another person. That's the foundation for marriage. Are you cultivating that union to your spouse by submitting to God? The best thing you can do for your husband is to fear God. The best thing you can do for your wife is to fear God. And then to ask the question, because a man who fears God, what does he do? The next verse says, who walks in his ways. Blessed is the man who fears God and doesn't leave it there, but walks in his ways. And what are his ways? The, the, the ways of humility, the ways of forgiveness, the ways of kindness, the ways of love does not seek its own. Love is patient. Love is kind. God's ways are not our ways. So to ask your spouse, how can I serve you? How are you not getting the nutrients you need? How are you not getting the time you need? And, and, and to realize that every vine's different. So you can't base how you treat your vine off Instagram or base how you treat your vine off of Pinterest, but to actually ask your wife, here's some homework this week. Ask your wife the question, how am I not meeting your needs? And then shut up. <laughs> and no matter what she says, don't you dare argue. And then hopefully she'll ask you that same question. What do you need more of? What do you need less of? Because vines need pruning too, don't they? Cultivation in includes pruning. What needs to be removed? What needs to be reduced? What needs to be added? Pro tip, do not do this on your date night. <laughs> It'll ruin it. And second pro tip, have a date night. Because men, you realize if you don't date your wife, the devil will find someone who will. So we must date our mates. But then I found, my wife Jenny and I found, put the check-in on a different day. 
So then the date night comes up. If any of the hard conversations come up on the date night, we just get to go, we're putting a pin in that till the check-in. The check-in is where we have the hard conversations, aka we get in fights during the check-ins. The dates are just for fun. The dates are just for joy. The dates are like this little Sabbath, this little taste of heaven. But you got to have the check-in. You can't just keep putting a pin in it infinitely. Yeah, we'll talk about that one day. You have to have those times where you get it out there, and you deal with it, and you have the hard conversations to see that you can cultivate that vine. The second thing vines need, because God wants for your vine to be fruitful, is for it to stay connected. Connected. Vines have branches, and the only way to fruit, the only path to fruit is constant connection. That's why your fast is so significant. It tightens your connection to heaven. That's why being in a small group is so significant. It tightens your connection to heaven. Your own personal quiet time tightens your connection. Did not Jesus say, and I'll put it up on the screen, in the handwriting of Buzz Aldrin, for it was the verse that he read as he took communion, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. I'll point out he also brought with him Psalm 8 to the moon, which says, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy hands, the sun, the moon, and the stars, what is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? What is the son of man that you would visit him? It's unbelievable to think about how much your spirit's lifted when you look to the heavens. Outer space informs inner space. And I love that Buzz brought with him not only wine to take as a part of his communion meal, but also this verse, which tells us what vines need, constant connection. So in your relationship with Jesus, you have to fight to stay connected. And ironically, this is the best way to grow close to your spouse. I don't have to really try to stay near Jenny, and Jenny doesn't have to try to stay near me. Why? Draw a triangle in your notes. Do it right now. Draw a little triangle. Write your husband's name on the one of the lower points. Write your name on one of the lower points. And on the top point, write the name Jesus. Check it out. If you are moving closer to Jesus and he's moving closer to Jesus, you're moving closer to each other without even trying to. So you don't have to try and stay connected to each other. Just stay connected to Jesus, which makes the selection of your spouse highly important, doesn't it? that you would want to marry someone whose sum total of their life's goals is to move closer to Jesus. Thus, we don't try and go meet someone who's got a big bank account or big biceps or a fast car or, or, or whatever, and then try and squeeze them into following Jesus. That's a recipe for disaster. And I know the argument, Levi, but he's hot. So is hell. That's not the point. You want to find someone who's madly in love with Jesus and then together continue to pursue him and to fight for that connection to remain strong. Vines need to be cultivated. Vines need to remain connected as well. Vines, we know they can climb. Vines can climb. But what do they climb on? A trellis. What do they climb on? A wire. What do they climb on? The, the, the side of a building. If you've ever seen a wild grape vine, it's a mess. All that potential, all that growth, all just this terrible bush. It'll climb up something, climb up here. But if the, if the, if the growth isn't directed, it's worthless. It will never produce what it should if, it, if its growth isn't directed across something. So what do we need for our vines? We need trellis. And I submit to you God's blessings out of Zion, the text says. Fear God, walk in his ways. Your wife's going to be fruitful. Your kid's like all plants. May God bless you out of Zion. Where do I know that word? Of course, it's shorthand throughout the Bible for Jerusalem and the mount where Jesus died on the cross. But it's also, according to Hebrews 12, a nickname for the church. As we come together, this is the blessing out of Zion. This, this prayer, this faith, this expectation, this kind of life change, what an amazing thing it is to, you, to have for the guiding of your vine, the local church, James River Church, for you to together say, hey, you're a row of that vineyard, I'm a row in that vineyard, and, and we're going to do this, and this is going to guide us. This is going to guide our faith. This is going to inform our growth. We're not just aimless. We're not just doing our own thing, trying to follow Jesus. We have this church. We have come to Mount Zion, to an innumerable company of angels and saints. This is the guideline 
This is the wire. This keeps our growth on the same trajectory as we give, as we serve, as we pray, as we fast. It guides the growth. And we're not just existing for the weekend. What a waste. You know, to get the jet ski out, to get Billy into college, to, to, because of soccer. Something's going to guide your family. Something's going to guide, you're going to orient yourself around something. But to do so for the glory of God and the name of Jesus and his kingdom advancing in the world, that's blessing. That's strength. And I realize it's really great to get your kids into college. It's even better to get them into heaven. And so we have a guide so our vines can climb. And then there's this. If we continue to fight for our vines, there is fruit to be collected. Collected. Because it's, the text doesn't just say your wife will be like a vine. It says your wife will be like a fruitful vine. Out of that healthy soul, out of that growing, flourishing marriage and family, there will be fruit to collect. The fruit of passion, for sure. The fruit of growth in the gift of sex and how you enjoy it. Taking the pressure, married, newly married couples, taking the pressure off that wedding night, taking the pressure off that honeymoon, taking all expectations that you've seen in movies and all these things and deleting them and, and growing together in how you enjoy that gift of sex. My wife and I, we have been married 18 years and the sex has never been better. I can't wait to get home to her. My heart <laughs> skips a beat every time I pull into our driveway. Why? Because I love her. And I, I, I just have, 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 I've suffered with her. I've prayed and grieved with her. And I know a lot of people, you, you would look at your marriage and go, well, it's not like that. And, and my, you think you need to get into a new marriage because you don't, your heart doesn't go pitter-patter anymore. No, you need to take care of your vine so it can be fruitful. And to, to go start a new vine somewhere else, and you're going to have the initial surge of joy and dopamine that comes from starting that new vine, for sure. But any vine that you plant takes eight years before it can get to fruitful. Anywhere in Napa or Tuscany, any vine you see, it took eight years to get, to get significant fruit off it. Olive plants, olive plants don't produce a substantial crop until they're 10 to 15. A lot of you are frustrated with your kids. If you plant an olive tree tomorrow, you won't get any fruit for four to seven years and 10 to 15 before you get fruit. All I'm saying is don't forget to do the hard work in secret that no one sees so down the road you can enjoy the fruit that everybody will be jealous of. <laughs> to start over with a new vine, to start over with new olive plants, that, that's just, that's, just that, that's so dumb. That's like being mad that your checking account has no money in it, so going to a different bank and starting a new account. <laughs> it's only going to have what you put into it, into it. Check it out. Here's how you spell a thriving marriage. Ready? W-O-R-K. Like Rihanna said, you got to work, 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 work. <laughs> you will eat the labor of your hands. We have a part to play to see our marriages and our family thrive. It's been said that the only kind of exam you can't cram for is a dental exam. Stay up all night flossing the night before your dental appointment, right? I think parenting's kind of like that. You can't cram for your child turning 18. Stay up all night the day before trying to have every hard conversation you should have been having. Trying to cram 18 years of being in church instead of being at the lake because the weather was good. All the things you will wish you had done when your child's about to turn 18. The best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago but the second best time is right now. I say something new starts today. I say something in you breaks, and you say, I'm going to fear God, walk in his ways, love and serve my wife, love and serve my husband. Be a devoted tender of little olive plants around my table and believe that's going to spill out and break out, that that's what the world needs most. For the kids in your neighborhood who are a part of broken homes to want to have a seat at your table for a meal. Because they sense something different going on in the culture of your house. You can't spell cultivate without the first couple letters of culture. What's the culture of your marriage? You should be asking this question. It should be informing. That's what, you don't have to do it in isolation either. Being a part of a church like this, it gives you amazing trellis for your little vines to grow on. And there will be fruit to be collected. Fruit of friendship, fruit of intimacy, fruit of passion. It will also as well 
continue to pay dividends long after you are dead. For the text says, may you see your children's children. And that's awesome. But I believe what you have to hold on to in faith, you won't actually get to see with your eye until eternity, is the continued change generation after generation after generation after you've been dead. The text says our kids are, are like olive plants, right? I find it interesting that if you look up the Smithsonian website, it will tell you that the oldest tree that's living on the planet today is an olive tree. Here's a photo of it. It's called the, the Big One. That's its nickname, the Big One. It is estimated to be as many as five or six, perhaps, thousand years old. Older than some of the redwoods that we know are really old. Older than the Mephibosheth tree. The big one. Do you know where this tree exists? Where it is today? In Bethlehem. Come on, somebody. That's just pretty. That means that when King David was singing Psalm 23, that tree heard. That means the wise men might have passed by it on their way to worship the newborn king. That means that Jesus himself could have possibly eaten olives from that tree. I believe as we do what God's called us to do, it's not sexy, it's not going to be some big, huge, awesome thing. No one's going to make a movie out of He was faithful to his wife. He kept his covenant. He would not harm his soul with an adulterous relationship. Pornography had no place in his spirit. He was there for his kids. He took his daughter on little dates and little outings. He was intentional about the rites of passage. He didn't let culture tell his son who he was. He spoke into his eyes. Now you are a man. When we do these things, not only can we believe for the fruit that we'll get to taste, but our kids will become like olive plants and our sons' sons, and our daughters' daughters, and our daughters' 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 sons. Jesus is faithful to keep his covenant for a thousand generations. This is how we save the world. We lead our families into the presence of God. We walk with Jesus ourselves, and we believe for that impact to ring out like the Bethlehem olive tree, the big one. And anytime we get afraid, anytime we doubt, that's working. Anytime we're, we're, we're ever overthinking it, which is going to be a lot. All we have to do to remember that God's promises are going to be kept in our lives and beyond is go out in the night sky and look up. For there's a Bible on the moon. Metaphorically, for sure, but also actually because of Dave Scott, who right here you see pictured in Apollo 15. That's Dave Scott. That's the first lunar rover that was ever brought to the moon. By Apollo 15, we were getting cocky. And you could tell guys were in charge because we, the best we could come up with is let's bring a car and go for a drive, right? But moments before Dave Scott got back into the lunar lander to leave, to go back to his ship, to come back home, his job was to park the lunar lander far enough away where it could film the departing spacecraft. So he did. But before he re-entered the spaceship, he took out of his personal collection of things he was allowed to bring to the moon, a small red Bible, and he opened it up and he put it on the dashboard of the lunar rover. And in his words, he said, Some, somehow, some way, someone may come to the moon and see this. And I want them to know who came here by seeing this Bible. And then he got into the ship and took off. Friends, the next time you look up at the night sky, don't just remember that, that there was someone who took communion there one day. There's a Bible on the moon. I, there's a Bible on the moon. And I just love it so much because God's word, Psalm 72, 7, says, may the righteous flourish during his reign and until the moon is no more, may there be peace. I'm daring you to believe that spilling on into the future through your family, through your legacy, through the generational impact, God's kingdom is not going to be stopped until the moon's no more. So if you, if you see a moon in the night sky, that, that, that means that God's promise to you is still in effect. 
Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.